Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, breaking down all the big games. We're on a week three, of course, with UCLA at home at the Rose Bowl to take on Oklahoma. It wasn't very pretty last year in Norman. And based on the results for the Bruins, the first two games, we could expect more of the same. Got a couple of last word on college football guys joining in to, to break it down from both sides with Tony Siracusa and Jason Ray. Guys, how you doing? Hey, Mark. Good to be with you, man. Hey, thanks for having us, Mark. Absolutely. Uh, enjoy the conversation with you guys each and every time. Uh, Jason, I got to say that since uh, UCLA could uh, use all the help they could get, I, I go, I, I know I try to stay neutral and balanced and don't play either side, but I, th I think Chip and the boys could use just, just a little push this week. So Jason, we'll start with you in regards to Oklahoma, uh, South Dakota, no match last week, Houston, a bit of one in spurts the week before. I don't know that we could have expected any more out of uh, Jalen Hurts, regardless of what the numbers are over the past couple games. Yeah, that's right, Mark. I mean, I think you at this point, you really just wonder what you know about Oklahoma. You know, after two games, they played um, they played a Houston team that was pretty overmatched, especially on the defensive side of the ball. They, they didn't come in. Uh, they came in with one of the worst defenses, probably probably right around there with Oklahoma in terms of their defenses of defensive efficiency last year. And then obviously when you play a, um, an FCS opponent um, like uh, South Dakota, that was sort of middle of the road last year, I believe there were a four and seven um, team in the FCS. You don't learn um, a terrible amount about your team, but I mean, I think to your point, yeah, Jalen Hurts has put up some um, pretty, pretty good numbers over the first couple of weeks. You know, he's, you know, he's up there in the, in terms of the, you know, top one, two, three in the Heisman uh, consideration as early as it is on in the season. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's um, been beneficial, you know, Mark, you and I had talked about this a lot early and then through the off season as well as his downfield passing. And, you know, he's, he's done pretty good so far. Um, but I think that, you know, that level as that level of competition, um, you know, heats up and gets a little bit stronger. We'll see. Um, we'll see how how that goes. Um, you know, I think it was a little bit of an uneven performance last week against South Dakota. I mean, granted, it's it's you know almost impossible for you know a team like Oklahoma to get up for that game to be excited for uh, an FCS opponent. So they were. It was a little bit of a sleepy start. Um, you know, to the first half, they were only only had um, twenty eight to nothing at halftime. They turned it on a little bit there in the third and early in the fourth quarter. But um, I think one area to look look for in the game, and I know we'll get to this a little bit um, later, is the offensive line struggled a bit. They have four um, they have four penalties that they they didn't. Um, you know, they didn't play with the urgency that you would expect a Lincoln Riley offensive team to play um, early on um, in that game. So, you know, we, we've talked about that as well. That's a work in progress with four of the five new, four of the five stars being brand new um, this year. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out as we as we move forward, not only in this game and get used to the but through the through the remainder of the season. All right, Tony. The storyline, I hate to put you in this position, but uh, you know what it is. It's much different going from Norman out west to, to L.A. Uh, with UCLA here. And it's less about, oh, what's the push going to be to the conference championship or what does the path look like? It's more about survival and what are the steps that we're going to see over the next few weeks that are going to give us hope that this football team is on the right track and that this coach is on the right track with this program. And, uh, you know, you just came from practice mm -hmm. and Chip Kelly and this crew is playing in front of an empty house to a certain extent. Uh, as you mentioned to me before we came on 25 or 32,000 at the San Diego, San Diego state game, a uh, 25 year low. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the fan base is just, uh, pretty apathetic as would be expected. Yeah. Look, Chip is going to need something more than your blue shirt that you're wearing to, to bring them, you know, something extra this week. Um, the San Diego state game was horrible on, on pretty much all fronts. Look, the, the two teams that UCLA has lost to have scored, you know, six points in their, in their non UCLA games, but they've scored a combined 47 against UCLA. You know, and I hear Jason talking about some questions about the downfield accuracy of Jalen Hurts. But if you watch UCLA in the San Diego State game, UCLA was playing such a soft zone and a cover three that it was a bunch of dumps underneath. It was a bunch of 10, 11, 12 yard passes that was killing them and putting them downfield. You know, it's the kind of it's the kind of defense that, you know, Hurts could eat alive pretty easily. 
Um, the mentality at UCLA right now is, is a question. Where is the team? Where are they mentally? Where are they emotionally? It was one of the things I asked in the post-game press conference uh, after Saturday's game. And the answers were, we're trying to hold it together. I believe in these guys. They believe in me. The kinds of things you expect to hear. But on Sunday of this week, uh, UCLA had a players-only meeting. And usually when you have a players-only meeting, that generally doesn't bode well for the coach. It, it, it looks like some kind of mutiny. That was not the case here. This was seniors, upperclassmen, particularly on the defense. Uh, when we talked in the post-game press conference, defensive back Quentin Lake uh, talked a lot about putting together a meeting, and they wound up having it on Sunday. And we talked to Dorian Thompson Robinson at practice to get his feedback on, on the players only meeting. And he said it was about players venting that some of the upperclassmen didn't like the body language they saw from players when there were plays that were busted, either defensively or offensive plays that didn't work. They didn't like the body language. There was a lot of head hanging during the game, not just after the loss, but during the game. And so it was a chance for players to address the um, emotional stability, if you will, the mental standpoint, the mental fortitude of their own teammates. And uh, DTR said it wasn't calling anybody out, wasn't pointing fingers. It was about dealing with these things now before you start pointing fingers, which happens quite often when team starts losing. You know, they're, they're 20, as of now, they're 22 point underdogs to Oklahoma, and I got to tell you, that's a soft 22. Um, you know, I, I would be surprised if UCLA stays in, within three touchdowns of them. Absolutely. Uh, I had not heard the line as soon as he came out of your mouth. I thought, uh, it can, if we can stop this short, this recording, I, I may have something <laughs> to do. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that just doesn't seem like a whole lot for, for this matchup, but uh, certainly there are backdoor covers out there. But back to the football on the field. Uh, UCLA hosting uh, Oklahoma. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, breaking it down with Tony Siracusa. And we got Jason Ray on the line from Last Word on college football. So we encourage you to get over there, check out their work, and uh, everyone else over there, Lauren Beasley, uh, in addition to a number of people that uh, we have on here on a regular basis. So, Tony, uh, you talked to Dorian Thompson Robinson. Uh, he's a very young player who played about three quarters of last season, something in that range, half the season. He's got some games under his belt, but at the same time, he's the face of the program, and he's a guy that now has to deal with uh, everything kind of imploding around him to a certain extent, both uh, on the field, but also just the negative talk and having to bear up under that. Yeah, and there is a lot of that. Look, he was getting booed late in the first half uh, Saturday against San Diego State. In the third quarter, he had some beautiful passes. I mean, his touchdown pass to, to the tight end, Dulcich, in a crowd, in the end zone, just right on the money. He had a couple of other passes that he just ripped right into players, you know, uh, in, in motion, right on target, right in step. But then when he misses, he's missing by a mile. And you're not going to put it all on him. Sometimes it's receivers that are cutting the route short or not, not doing what they're supposed to do. But when you've got a wide open receiver, wide open, like he had a few times, and you're throwing three feet wide, goodness sakes, the crowd is not going to be happy. You know, the most popular guy on most teams, unless you're Oklahoma or a few, you know, unless you're Alabama with Tua, the most popular guy is the backup quarterback. And there, there have been a lot of calls on social media for the backup quarterback, Austin Burton to see some playing time. One of the cautionary tales you got to throw at UCLA fans, though, is they do not have a backup on the roster who has taken a single snap in a college game. You want to put them up against Alex Grinch's Oklahoma defense now? Really? I mean, you know, hey, look, maybe Chip winds up having no choice at some point, depending upon how DTR plays. Chip Kelly at practice put a lot of the onus for DTR's mistakes on the offensive line. He said they're not doing a good enough job protecting them. Um, he's having to throw in a hurry and yeah, you watch the film again and you can see that that's true. There are times he's also holding onto the ball too long. Um, but he doesn't seem in rhythm. There's, and he talked about this, that he feels in rhythm that first few series of the game, but then as things don't work, he starts to feel the pressure he starts to try and do too much. And, and Chip Kelly put a lot of that on the offensive line telling them, you know, telling us they need to do a better job this week. 
Jason, typically you get a matchup like Oklahoma against another power five. And there's a lot of rhetoric about, uh, you know, what, what the other team brings to the table, uh, especially a brand like UCLA, not necessarily this particular team, but I got to think uh, all the talks surrounding Oklahoma is just, if we do what we need to do, we should be fine this week. Yeah, I think that's pretty much spot on Mark. I mean, I think the one thing that you worry about with a, with a team, the first, ro- the first road test of a, of a, of a season, you, you wonder how the, especially the the younger players, how they're going to react, you know, what does the, especially when you travel, you know, from Oklahoma, you know, to, to Los Angeles, to, you know, to the West coast there, you know, how, how do they play when the, how do they play when the lights come on when they're not, when they don't have, you know, 80,000 fans, uh, you know, supporting them and that kind of thing. What does, how does Jalen Hurts play in his first row game as Oklahoma? You got to, you, you know, you figure with a guy with this, the pedigree that he has, um, you know, probably won't be too much of a challenge for him, um, you know, kind of knowing what he's been through at Alabama. But, you know, some of the younger players, how do the, how do the four new offensive linemen um, play in that type of setting? How do the defense of, you know, the defense has been a little bit improved. You could tell um, they got three turnovers last week against South Dakota. Um, and, and you can tell that defense looks a little bit different. Um, but, you know, once they're, uh, once they're on the road, how, how does that look? And then, you know, I mean, Tony talked a lot about this. UCLA has faced a lot of adversity over the first couple of weeks, whereas Oklahoma's really not faced any, right, with, with Houston. They got off to such a big lead against Houston, and then obviously South Dakota kind of speaks for itself. So, you know, what does that look like? Should, um, you know, should a, you know, the surprising thing happen? And, you know, maybe Oklahoma gets down a score earlier. You know, there's a couple of turnovers or, or something happens. How does, how does a team on the road with very lofty expectations, handle that adversity when it happens first. I mean, those are the things I think that um, Lincoln Riley and Alice Grinch and the, and the, you know, both the offense and defensive staff and, you know, overall as a team, we'll be interested to see, you know, how do, how do we react to that initial adversity of the season? What does the, what does the makeup of my team look like when, when something like that happens? You know, Tony, my biggest indication that the offensive line's not doing the job for UCLA is not that Dorian Thompson Robinson's struggling, because certainly if anyone watched the Cincinnati game, and I think a few more people did than the San Diego State game because of the TV scheduling, it's more so that Joshua Kelly's averaging 3.5 yards per carry. Now, I know there's a health issue there, but so where where does he stand going into this week? Because the ready-made formula for, I don't want to call it an upset, I'll say to stay in the game would be that he just grinds the clock and grinds down that defense. Yeah, he didn't play in week one. Chip Kelly held him out because he wasn't convinced his knee was ready to go yet. Um, He played last week, but only had, I don't have it in front of me, but somewhere about 15 carries. And I asked him in the post-game press conference, where are you physically? I mean, are, are you ready to, to go back to 25, 30 carries? And it was interesting because he really deflected. Uh, what he said was, you know, I think the coaches are wanting to do the smart thing and take a look at my knee and see how much I can work. You know, I'm a competitor. I'm always ready to go. But he put a lot of that off, not on his knee or, or his willingness to go more, but on the coaches and the training staff. So, you know, we don't know what, what, he's, gonna, what he's got there. And to go back to, you know, an actual football uh, analysis standpoint, look, you're going to face a very difficult defense. Chip Kelly brought up today how Alex Grinch, you know, they're obviously very familiar with his defenses from his time at, at Washington State, but how he brings a lot of players from a lot of different angles. And you're always having to keep your head on a swivel to see where they're coming from. It's very aggressive. And, you know, you need a better combination of some DTR success, you don't need them. You don't need them chucking the ball downfield 50, 60 yards. You need them having some 10, 11, 12 yard successes to move the ball and a, a Kelly running game. You've got to have a combination of both. Uh, you know, backup Martel Irby is, is not completely healthy. They've been using Demetri Felton since the Cincinnati game, it was a wide receiver who they put in there. Um, because Kaz Allen, as best as anyone knows, is still on academic suspension. And so, you know, you were stacked at running back this, you know, last year. Now you're looking at one with a receiver as the backup. You, you, you've got to have, you got to have a little bit of both to have any chance of staying in the game against Oklahoma. Tony, Chip Kelly, I don't need to remind you of this. He's three and 11. He's three and 11. We knew that he had uh, a large reclamation project, but I think many of us thought that he could keep it in the 500 range for the first couple of years Mm -hmm. before this thing took off. 
Uh, so that's the bottom line. There's a lot that goes into anybody's record, but uh, the fan base apathetic, but those few who are tuning into the games and showing up at the stadium, maybe not so apathetic, uh, probably a bit in, a, in an outrage. Yeah, there's a little bit of everything, and you and I have, have talked about this before, and I say it only somewhat tongue-in-cheek. UCLA fans, it's, it's Los Angeles. They get upset. They get upset for a half hour and vent online for a half hour and then go online to see, you know, if they can still get concert tickets or something at Staples Center. Uh, you know, you got the Dodgers making the postseason now. You got basketball training camp with the Lakers and the Clippers right around the corner. You got the Rams and the Chargers playing. There, there's only so much bandwidth for them being upset that they're going to have. Um, but there is a great deal of impatience. If, if, if you read the fan boards right now with Chip Kelly, part of it is he keeps relying on the youth of the team. And we get that. They have, they have something like 85 freshmen and sophomores, either freshmen, true freshmen, redshirt freshmen, and then sophomores. And that is a huge number. And 52 players uh, last week uh, played their first uh, play played for the first time that were either in that category, freshman, redshirt, freshman, or sophomore, 52. And 29 of them were making their UCLA debuts when they, when they got on the field. There is a great deal of youth, but there was a great deal of youth last year. And the point coming into this season was we're still young, but we're experienced because a lot of those young players had to see a lot of playing time last year. So you can't keep relying on the youth when these guys have taken snaps in games. The majority of them have taken snaps. Yes, you are young. You have very few seniors. You are one of the three youngest teams in the entire country. Okay, got it. Move on. As Chip likes to say, so what? What's next? You know, you got to move on from that youth. To, to the point of the fan base that, that you brought up, I mean, it's a situation now where UCLA is giving away tickets to the game this week. Giving away tickets to Oklahoma playing at the Rose Bowl. It's unconscionable that they're in that situation. But they sent out an email to any of the season ticket holders who use their tickets for the San Diego State game. Like it was a one o'clock game. It was triple digit heat in the, in, in the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. There were probably about 10,000, 8,000 maybe San Diego State fans who made the two hour drive up. So the UCLA fans had to endure a lot. So they sent a letter saying, if you used your season tickets, you endured Saturday's loss, we're going to give you four free general admission seats to the Oklahoma game. You've got to be kidding me. It's Oklahoma coming into town. Even Chip said, I don't, Chip said today, I don't care if Oklahoma's 5th, 15th, 25th, they are Oklahoma. And when they come into town, they get your attention. Yeah, but maybe not the fans. <laughs> Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, and uh, we get your attention hopefully each and every day with uh, the best discussion, debate, and analysis with gentlemen like this. Jason Ray representing Oklahoma with a big matchup with Rose Bowl and Tony Saragusa, those poor UCLA Bruins, uh, both the last word on college football, so we encourage you to jump over there. So, Jason, that's uh, the narrative on the UCLA side. On the Oklahoma side, I guess the only thing that I can think of to complain about at this point from the fan base is that we've had five years of college football playoffs. We've had Oklahoma make it three times. They haven't won. They have been the the, the, the banner you know, uh, of the Big 12. They've held the banner for the Big 12. Uh, no non-conference games that we can gauge this team on necessarily from a national standpoint in regards to running into that. Uh, Ohio State uh, two consecutive years going back a few years ago for Oklahoma. Yeah, I mean, I think that's 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 pretty right on mark. I, I mean, I, I think you know overall the narrative certainly is um, is getting back to the playoffs, and certainly not only just getting back to the playoffs, but they need a win um, if they if they, if they get there. You know, that with Alabama and Clemson, you know, being you know pretty much everybody's one and two right now. You know, you, you got to think, you know, if you're in the playoffs, you're going to have to knock off one of those one of those people. So, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and I think to to another extent. You know, me and Tony had this discussion earlier in the week. You know, even though UCLA is a little bit down, it's still it's still an iconic opponent. You know, kind of maybe not necessarily in the same breath, but but still, whether it's UCLA, whether they're up or whether they're down, then you um, 
you know, you respect, you respect that name, you respect that stadium, you respect that venue. So, you know, you know, you would hope, and I, and I think, you know, both you, you listen to Jalen Hurts and even Lincoln Riley and then offensive line coach Bill Beanbow to a certain extent. I mean, and all three of those, they're, they're pretty disappointed on the way they've started this year, which, which I think what, what has happened here is I think Jalen Hurts has brought a different, whether you call it just being kind of Saban's clone there, or you've, in fact, you know, Jalen Hurts at the, at the press conference, he did use the, the famous uh, Nick Saban rat poison um, comment ahead of the South Dakota game. So, um, you know, he's bringing a lot of that. You know, there's been a few questions where um, they'd ask uh, Jalen about, you know, about his stance on the Heisman. He said, you know, how does he feel? How important is that? And he said winning is the only thing that's important to him. So I think the fact that, you know, they they put, they put 70 points on uh, South Dakota and then 49 points on – um, Houston, I think, I think it's a little bit of a different mindset in Oklahoma this year. It's more, I mean, I, I think last year, you know, with how terrible the defense was, I think in, in some, um, in some sort of way, they were happy to be there, um, happy to be there, happy to play Alabama, you know, especially as the, they were a little shell shocked as they first started that game. So, uh, so I think the mindset really is just more about them taking care of business and playing as efficient as they can on both sides of the ball. I think, you know, I think, like I said, that mentality, Alex Grinch has brought a, a, a speed mentality, a physical mentality, and a more aggressive mentality to the defensive side of the ball. They did get those three turnovers that his, his um, you know, that he, he preaches, that he predicates his, his team on, is getting turnovers um, through games. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see as it you know, kind of manifests itself through the, through the rest of the season. Do we see that defense make that gradual improvement as they, as they get through the season? I mean, it's never going to be one of those defenses where they average, you know, they give up 14 to 17 points a game. You know, in the past, happy Big 12, they're going to score some points, right? So I think it's about getting those turnovers and how do they improve to put themselves in the same conversation with Alabama and Clemson, be able to compete um, at that national level. All right, Tony, uh, UCLA defending uh, historic home turf there at the Rose Bowl, as Jason mentions, also playing one for, I, I want to say, uh, a sense of pride to a certain extent. Uh, I know that I, we mentioned uh, in our preseason preview discussion with you when you mentioned that there might be a breaking point between the fan base swaying toward, hey, we went two and one non-conference versus one and two. I don't know how I feel about one and two, but that one and two wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, depending on how they played, but they're staring at Oh, and three. And I know I brought that up at the time. Yeah. You were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, because of three quality opponents, no FCS to, to lean on or a low level group of five. And this is what UCLA is facing. So uh, your final thoughts about uh, UCLA's uh, shot at an upset or just building blocks that we could see a more improved football team this week. I think really that's the thing you got to look at because it's not just that they lost at Cincinnati. It was a winnable game. It's not like they went to Cincinnati and got blown out. You had four DTR turnovers. Twice he fumbled without ever being touched. Um, you know, th those, are, those are mental mistakes. You look at last week, they knew that they were going to play a tough defense in San Diego State because Rocky Long is one of the great defensive minds in college football. And yet they looked, they, they looked ill-prepared for what they saw. Um, defensively, they, they were a disaster. I mean, Quentin Lake talked about how the San Diego State quarterback was tipping his hand. They knew from game field, anytime he went to his hand towel before a play, it was a pass, yet he still tore them apart underneath. So I think if you're UCLA, from the UCLA standpoint, you're not expecting a win here. You're now swallowing 0-3 to start the season before you head up to Washington State for what's going to be a very tough conference opener. At this point, you're looking for signs of life. You're looking for improvement. You're looking for some fight out of your players. You're, you're looking for them to step up, show some emotion, show some heart, and, and, and play with Oklahoma for as long as they humanly can. You know, I mean, I just, I, I'm, I think that's the best you can hope for, you know. Bruins and Sooners at the Rose Bowl on a Saturday national television audience. And uh, we will hope for the best. Uh, I usually don't take sides in this one, Jason, but uh, <laughs> I would love to see a decent ball game uh, at the great venue between uh, two recognizable uniforms for even the fringe college football fans. When you get those two together on the field, I remember them playing a series somewhere in the eighties mm -hmm. way back when I, I can't peg the years right now. And of course, uh, most famously Troy Aikman making that transition from Oklahoma 
to UCLA before he launched his uh, great NFL career. All right, guys, we appreciate you stopping by to break this one down. All right, Mark, glad to do it. Yeah, thanks for having us, Mark.